What's up, everybody? It's Eon Cure with a Metal Gear Solid 5 analysis and discussion video. Today, I want to share my analysis and thoughts on Kenji Yano's interpretations of Phantom Pain's story, as well as his justifications for some of the complaints that people had about the game, all of which he shared through an interview that he did with Famitsu. For the interview's full contents, check out my previous video, which I highly recommend you do before proceeding, as I'll be referencing the information quite often. Now, for those who don't know who Kenji is, he is responsible for writing Metal Gear Solid Naked, a standalone book that dissects the Metal Gear series, and he also did the planning and editing for the Metal Gear Solid novelizations by authors Project Ito, Satoshi Hase, and Hitori Nojima. Add on top of that, the fact that he knows Kojima personally, and you've got a man who probably has more insight into Kojima's storytelling mindset than anyone else. The interview kicked off with an analysis of one of Kojima's tweets from September 15th, 2015 regarding Phantom Pain's story. The original tweet was in Japanese, but it has since been officially translated as follows. V liberates Snake from the bonds of fate, and by passing the baton to the player, who was previously bound to Snake, they can bring the legend full circle. This parting of ways should not become some phantom pain, but an empty space that, by remaining unfilled, serves as motivation for the player to move forward. Kojima basically seems to be saying that with MGS5, the player has been separated from Snake to become a unique character within the series, with a baton of Big Boss passed onto them. A separation that Kojima believes shouldn't become a phantom pain, but an empty space that motivates players to move forward. Kenji's interpretation is that this empty space was never meant to be filled, and that it's because of this empty space that we have room to move forward and make progress. By empty space, they are probably referring to the many unknown elements in Phantom Pain's story, particularly the gaps between Phantom Pain and Metal Gear 1. The empty space is like unpainted sections of a canvas. I think what Kojima and Kenji are trying to say is that the unpainted sections that resulted from the separation between Snake and Player were left there for us to fill with our own stories, particularly through FOB, the endgame of MGS5, where we get to infiltrate other mercenary outfits and make choices like building or disarming nukes, which features its own set of themes and messages that Kenji dives into during his Famitsu interview. I do wish there was more to do, more choices to make, and more missions to fulfill after the Truth mission, even if in the form of DLC, to really sell the idea that players are filling the gaps between MGS5 and Metal Gear 1 with their own stories. But the basic idea was that empty spaces throughout Phantom Pain belong to us, the Phantom Big Bosses. Another interesting association that Kenji made about the empty space is that it's symbolized by the whale Moby Dick, and you will find that this is quite accurate when you look at what Moby Dick represents in Herman Melville's novel. A well-known interpretation of the whale is that it is not so much a character in the book, but rather a force of nature that is beyond comprehension and that cannot be defied. In addition, Moby Dick is also said to symbolize the unknown, as represented by how it mostly remains underwater and is seldom seen in its entirety by the naked eye. While Moby Dick is available for human observation and interpretation on the surface, its depths conceal the unknown. An empty space, if you will. So in the same manner that Moby Dick symbolizes the all-powerful, the undefiable, and the unknown in Herman Melville's novel, one can assume that Phantom Pain also uses Moby Dick as an indication of the unknown elements and empty space within the story, a space that is left for us, the players, to fill as the new big boss. Very interesting indeed. I definitely do agree that it was indeed Kojima's intention to leave some gaps in the Metal Gear lore unfilled in Phantom Pain, to leave room for us to mark our own legacy, unique to each player depending on their experiences with the game. As it turns out, we were that missing link that one of the trailers alluded to in one of its title cards, and thus Kojima gave Snake back to the players. Now, some of you may wonder about the disparities that the addition of Venom Snake caused for the Solid Snake era of Metal Gear games, in which there isn't a single mention or hint of Venom Snake, which resulted from the fact that Venom Snake wasn't officially conceptualized until the development of MGS5. But this was something that was taken into consideration. Something that Kojima constantly expresses in MGS5 is that legends are just that. Legends. Now go! Let the legend come back to life. 
exaggerated truths fitting the ideal image of how society prefers to remember someone and not what they actually were. Kenji used Moby Dick as an example. He talked about how Ahab's heroics are often exaggerated in his final confrontation with Moby Dick when it was in reality pretty one-sided, with Moby Dick swiftly overpowering Ahab and crew and killing everyone except for the sole survivor, Ishmael. But that's not how most people perceive Ahab these days. Instead, he's seen as the David to the Moby Dick Goliath, the small yet heroic figure that clings to life as he fights an evil monster. Kenji believes that this alternate impression can be attributed to retellings of the story, namely things like movie adaptations of the book. Kenji particularly referred to the Moby Dick movie directed by John Huston in 1956, which displays Ahab heroically battling Moby Dick as if delivering American justice. And through this kind of retelling of the Moby Dick story, people's perception of Ahab changed to something more heroic, patriotic, and legendary. It's a similar scenario for Big Boss. Like Kenji says, the idea of heroism changing is familiar territory for MGS. Like Captain Ahab, Big Boss's story was told and retold until it was shrouded with blatant lies and exaggeration. Eva herself stated so in Metal Gear Solid 4, if you recall. The truth behind Big Boss became riddled with exaggeration, misrepresentation, and outright lies. The truth that Big Boss at one point was comprised of two entities, Naked Snake and Venom Snake, was a well-kept secret that was forgotten and overshadowed by the legends, in the same manner that Ahab's less heroic attributes became overshadowed by retold heroic versions of the story. This idea of legends is further referenced in Ocelot's Shalashaska tape, in which you can hear Ocelot talking about how his reputation was exaggerated until he came to be feared as Shalashaska. The gorillas were using the name amongst themselves by the time I got to hearing about it. Pronunciation had wound up as Shalashaska. So half gulag, half hero sword is a perfect fit. But you see how rumors and ideas about people can get out of hand fast. Once you create a character and put it out there in public mind, it warps and twists with every baseless rumor. And before you know it, all people see are phantoms. Another example of this is the boss, who was conveniently erased from the history books and deemed a traitor to fit America's needs despite her true nature as a patriot and a hero. Similarly, Legends of the Future won't remember Venom Snake, but MGS5 is meant to offer us the opportunity to experience the real stories leading up to Metal Gear 1, the things the legend don't know about, to fill that empty space with our own stories, despite what legends might say about Big Boss in later years. And even after Venom Snake meets his demise at the end of Metal Gear 1, the idea is that he lives on in the real world through us the player. Through MGS5, Kojima attempts to convey that us people in the real world are all big bosses, that we all have the power to change and influence the world, to steer the course of history. The way I see it is that Kojima changed Big Boss from a character to a symbol. It's kind of like Batman, or at least Nolan's Batman. Bruce Wayne says the idea of Batman was to be a symbol. Anyone could be Batman. The idea was to be a symbol. Batman could be anybody. So essentially, Batman was Bruce Wayne's way of saying that anyone can pick up the mantle and do something about the corruption in Gotham City. Same idea with Big Boss. By passing the title onto us, it's his way of saying we too have the power to influence the world in our own way. Now, whether you think Kojima succeeded in expressing all this or whether you liked this approach is a matter of personal preference. Me personally, I really appreciate that aspect of Phantom Pain. I think it's cool as shit and the kind of thing you can only do in a video game. However, I also believe that Kojima took the idea of empty space a bit too far. Aside from the empty space between MGS5 and Metal Gear 1 feeling too empty to make it feel like we're filling it with our own stories, I particularly have a problem with the empty space present while the story still belongs to Big Boss, before it's handed to the players in the Truth Mission. Chapter 2 specifically comes to mind. As many of you know, only several of its missions offer anything new or progress the story in any way, a stark contrast to the packed Chapter 1. As a result, many fans felt the unevenness of Chapter 2 and understandably lashed out. 
Kenji does attempt to save some face for Phantom Pain by pointing out that the feeling of things being unresolved are also present in Moby Dick, in which there wasn't any kind of epic one-on-one -on -one battle between Ahab and Moby Dick as one might expect. I also want to add that there was no epilogue in Moby Dick's first printings, which parallels Phantom Pain. But I will argue two things. One, at least Moby Dick's encounter, as one-sided as it was, still had substantial build-up to it, of which there was none in Phantom Pain leading up to the Truth Mission. But more importantly, too, just because a story makes deep connections to a classic novel doesn't excuse it for lackluster storytelling and pacing. I'm honestly a bit irritated that both Kojima and Kenji seem to be addressing criticisms to the story by simply stating, it's a Moby Dick reference, it's deep as shit, and therefore it's a masterpiece. In this statement, Kenji Yano's response to criticisms regarding things feeling unresolved or the feeling that there is something missing in Phantom Pain is basically, same goes for Moby Dick, so it's all good. Let's get two things straight. One, Metal Gear is not Moby Dick, so just because something works in Moby Dick doesn't mean it'll work in Metal Gear. And two, no story should rely on its literary devices as its core. A story needs to be able to stand on its own, and literary devices should be there to enhance the core story, not overtake it. It's so self-indulgent at times, the way they bask at their ability to be deep, but I think this time, in going too deep, some of that Metal Gear storytelling magic was lost. I think Kojima went too far with the literary connections, to the point where the story can't stand on its own without all the metaphors, symbolisms, and meta-elements. We know from games like MGS3 that Kojima is capable of balancing themes and messages with a solid plot, but with Phantom Pain, his overindulgence on the former paved the way for an unbalanced overall story. The contrary could be said about MGS3, which doesn't try too hard to be deep. I mean, the deep stuff is there, but the reason Snake Eater's story is so fucking good is because it prioritizes an awesome core plot involving the complicated relationship between mentor and apprentice, mother figure and son, the boss and naked snake, the sacrifices they both had to make in that relationship to be loyal to the end as a patriotic soldier of America, and the repercussions these sacrifices would come to have for the rest of the series. It's grand in scale yet so full of heart, and the themes and messages only serve to enhance Snake Eater's story not to overtake it. The same couldn't be said for Phantom Pain. Now, before you say, whoa, Yong, why so negative all of a sudden? Didn't you give the game high praise? Yes, I did, and I still do. Gameplay is stellar, cinematography and presentation are beyond anything I've ever seen, and believe it or not, I liked the story for what it was. It wasn't perfect, I didn't love it, and I don't think it was a good Metal Gear story, but I like that it attempts something so bold, out there, and unique. I like Kojima's earnest attempt to bring players and fans so much closer to the Metal Gear legacy as one last gift before his departure from the series. I like the cool literary devices and references, and I like how it all comes together to deliver a meaningful message. But there are clear narrative flaws, and I don't like the way it's being excused with it's a big-ass Moby Dick reference, so it's all good. It's like they're saying it's the player's fault for not liking aspects of the story because this shit's too deep for them, but if we spell it out for them, maybe that'll change their minds. I want to see Kojima and company own up to the flaws. We love the man, we love the way he's always pushing the boundaries, but when something doesn't work, there needs to be some understanding from their end as well. I particularly found this section of the interview distasteful, in which Kenji attempts to rationalize fans' negative reactions to the game's plot twist and its incomplete state. He began by saying that he thinks the negative reception began when fans found out that they weren't playing as Big Boss. He compared this to when MGS2 first came out, which initially received negative feedback for its protagonist switcheroo. He then pointed out that now MGS2 is considered a masterpiece, as if to say he expects MGS5's story to be received similarly with time. He also believes that MGS5's length contributed to amplifying the negative reception. But I would like to note that there are significant differences between how the protagonist switch played out between the two games. In MGS2, you find out you're playing as Raiden very early in the game, allowing players to become acclimated with the turn of events as they play the game despite initial reservations. Furthermore, you at least get to play a solid snake for a bit, and you at least get to follow his story, even if from a third-person perspective. In MGS5, on the other hand, the Venom Snake twist occurs at the very end of the game, 
there is very little room after the truth mission to become acclimated to the twist. It's a completely different feeling. But most disappointing of all for Metal Gear fans, in Phantom Pain, we never get to play as the real big boss or follow his story. As symbolically intended, he is there as Ishmael, the narrator and messenger to our Ahab. So anyway, he followed up by saying that after players experienced the plot twist, they found out about Mission 51. And then he theorized that fans' negative reaction to that had to do with the confusion and burden of suddenly finding out that it was us, the players, not a separate character, that participated in the massacre on Mother Base, in Quiet's disappearance, in Huey's exile, etc. That it was all an adverse reaction from the weight and burden put on the player's shoulders from experiencing themselves becoming the villain rather than watching as a third party. I'm sorry, but that's just straight up stupid. Kenji is really reaching here. I think you will agree that the whole Venom Snake being the player thing has more symbolic value than immersive value. After all, regardless of Venom Snake's identity, it was still us the players who inputted the controller commands that killed the men on Mother Base. We were already fully immersed and felt the full gravity of that situation before finding out Venom Snake was a representation of the player, so the twist really didn't add much to the effect. Again, it's more symbolic than anything. I honestly don't think anyone actually felt like they were Venom Snake. Despite what he represents, Venom Snake still feels like his own individual character. He has his own personality, speaks his own dialogue, and makes his own decisions regardless of what players would have done in certain situations. So no, I highly doubt that finding out about Venom Snake's identity made us any more burdened than we already were when we thought we were playing as Big Boss. So Kenji's assumption that the Venom Snake plot twist is closely related to the negative reception of the missing Mission 51 doesn't hold any ground. They are two separate issues. I would have complained about Mission 51 even if I was playing as Big Boss. Now, Kenji says that he thinks Mission 51 isn't necessary. And maybe that's true as far as themes, messaging, and literary devices go, but does that make it right to leave that story arc hanging? For me, my answer is no. You gotta finish what you started. And then of course there's the issue of Chapter 2 being empty and horribly paced, and that too is a separate issue. Even if I were playing as Big Boss and the game included Mission 51, I still would have complained about Chapter 2, but the fact of the matter is that all three problems are present, and combined, they resulted in an adverse negative reception towards the game. And it doesn't help Kenji's player burden argument that it never really feels as though Venom Snake or the player is becoming a villain. Kenji mentions things like the massacre on Mother Base, Huey's exile, and Quiet's disappearance, but nothing in those scenarios evoked a sense of villainy. For the massacre on Mother Base, it was more tragic than villainous. Venom Snake had no choice but to shoot his own men to ensure that the vocal cord parasites don't leak out. Venom Snake was doing what he deemed right in that situation. As for Huey's exile, Venom Snake actually saved Huey from execution by exiling him. Furthermore, we the players had no say in how the whole thing played out, so it's hard for us to feel a one-on-one -on -one connection to the event. As I've stated before, Venom Snake representing the player has more symbolic value than immersion value. And I don't even know why he mentions Quiet's disappearance. Venom Snake goes to find her and rescue her, nothing villainous there. So my point is that Kenji's argument that some of the negative reception had to do with players venting out the burden and confusion that they felt from their villainous actions is complete bullshit. I wish Kojima and Kenji would stop looking to the players to rationalize the negative reception and look at the game itself for a change. Alright, so with that out of the way, let's move on to my analysis and thoughts on the fact that according to Kenji, Huey was supposed to be Ishmael, Venom Snake was still Ahab, and America was supposed to be Diamond Dog's main enemy. Huey originally played the role of a narrator of sorts who was biased towards American views and showed America as being right the whole time. So it looks like Huey was at odds with Diamond Dogs even in the early versions of Phantom Pain's story, which is interesting. As for why the role of Ishmael was changed from Huey to Big Boss, it has to do with perspective. During the interview, Kenji went in-depth about how defining the Ahabs and Moby Dicks of Metal Gear depends on perspective. For America, they are Ahab, while Big Boss and his mercenary unit is Moby Dick, a loose beast that must be hunted down. And for Big Boss, he is Ahab, while America is Moby Dick. 
the unstoppable great white whale that wronged him, which he must seek revenge against. Each entity believes themselves to be Ahab and the other Moby Dick, so Kenji pointed out that one way to look at MGS5 is a battle between Ahab versus Ahab, or Moby Dick versus Moby Dick, with the America Ahab justifying its actions with concepts like the pursuit of happiness, and with the Big Boss Ahab justifying his actions with intentions of exposing the fundamental villainy hidden within the actions that America righteously justifies with concepts like the pursuit of happiness. The strained relationship between America and opposing extremists is very much relevant today. The Big Boss and Diamond Dogs of our age are the jihadist extremists like ISIS that we hear so much about these days. From America's perspective, ISIS is Moby Dick, a monster in the form of an extremist organization that must be eradicated. But from ISIS's perspective, America is Moby Dick, believing that their extreme actions are justified with their intentions of exposing the hidden villainy behind America's self-righteous justifications. This is very much a moral gray area, and I don't say this to give ISIS credit or anything like that. They kill innocent people, spread fear and terror, and promote violence to solve their problems. But let's be real here. America isn't exactly innocent of these things either. The great country of opportunity isn't without its fair share of atrocities, which as a matter of fact, gave rise to organizations like ISIS as a form of retaliation. In the same manner that Big Boss's mercenary organizations, MSF, Diamond Dogs, Outer Heaven, and Zanzibar Land spawned from retaliation for America's actions. And as you may well know by now, this kind of cycle of retaliation and vengeance is a major theme in Phantom Pain. So when it came down to choosing the character to portray Ishmael, it really came down to whose side of the story Kojima wanted to tell. With MGS5, his intention was to have players, the Ahabs, experience firsthand the absurdity of being branded a villain by the manipulating ways of the global status quo. And in order to do so, Kojima felt that it couldn't be Huey narrating as he was siding with America, the global status quo. Instead, for the story he wanted to tell, he felt it was more appropriate for Big Boss to be the narrator, the legendary extremist leader of the Metal Gear series. So essentially, in MGS5, you're living among extremists and seeing things from that perspective, which is an angle that few dare to tackle. You look at most modern military mainstream games like Call of Duty or whatever, and it's all about the American perspective but MGS5 gives you a first row seat on the extremist side. You might as well be playing as the leader of a fictional ISIS-like group, through which Kojima tries to convey that the world is a far more complex place than you think, and that the line between good and evil is much blurrier than you can imagine. It's not as simple as America good, terrorists evil. There are gray areas to each side. When you consider Kojima's intentions, making Big Boss the game's Ishmael certainly seems like the right decision, although I have to wonder how drastically different the story would have been in the alternate version. It certainly would have been interesting to see Big Boss's mercenary odyssey from America's self-righteous perspective, although I suppose we do already experience some of that in Metal Gear 1 and 2, in which Big Boss is branded a villain, the Moby Dick, in his attempt to insurrect against the Patriots through Outer Heaven and Zanzibar Land. Kenji did hint that if MGS5 had been made under the original concept of Huey being Ishmael, it would have been a great deal darker and would have left fans far more dissatisfied. Hmm, I don't know. That sounds potentially more satisfying to me. I'll be honest, save for one or two instances, Phantom Pain overall didn't feel as dark as I was expecting it to be. I still think Ground Zeroes more accurately portrayed the darkness and taboo elements that Kojima hyped prior to MGS5's release. I will also say that I don't think Kojima entirely succeeded in portraying the complexities of America versus extremists. The biggest problem was that America was really never a presence in Phantom Pain. It's spoken of once in a while, especially by Skullface, but that's about it. The biggest threat to Diamond Dogs was Skullface, but the man is a rogue agent himself, another extremist. In many respects, his motivations are similar to Diamond Dogs, although his methods are far more hazardous. He even goes out of his way to tell Venom Snake how similar they are. We both are demons. Our humanity won't return. You, me, we've no place to run, nowhere to hide. And that is why I'll show you my demon.
Without America as a presence, the game is essentially missing that self-righteous Ahab to judge Diamond Dogs as a Moby Dick. As a result, it's hard to feel the absurdity of being branded a villain by the global status quo. I guess there's Huey, who condemns Snake for shooting his own men during the Parasite Breakout, and who calls Diamond Dogs murderers during his exile. But it was pretty hard to take any of the bullshit that came out of his mouth seriously. I guess players do get to feel the absurdity of being branded a villain by a sociopathic liar, but that's not quite the same as having a self-righteous America do the same. One final perspective I would like to talk about is the idea that the Patriots is Moby Dick. This notion becomes especially relevant during the Solid Snake era, in which the Patriots AI becomes fully operational and practically dominates the world. But Kenji pointed out how Phantom Pain and its Moby Dick motif reference this perspective. Something he talked about was how in the 17th and 18th century, the whale industry had once been a vital source of energy that kept the world going, having the same amount of influence as nuclear energy does today. Furthermore, body parts like bones and baleens, the latter of which are hair-like filters inside the mouth of whales, were used to create many of the era's commodities. Whale baleens, for example, were used to make frames for hoop skirts and corsets, and served as sofa springs and umbrella spokes. The way Kenji described it was that whales had almost creeped into and infiltrated our society through their vast influence. Notice how similar this is to the Patriots, who had creeped into and infiltrated the pseudo-historical society of Metal Gear and eventually extended their influence throughout the entire world, practically running it behind the scenes. And like Moby Dick, the Patriots can be sensed on the surface by those who look for it, but its depths conceal the unknown and the unknowable truths. So the Patriots is not only symbolized by Moby Dick in the sense that it's a vast, enigmatic, seemingly unstoppable and undefiable force, but also in the sense that its influence creeped and extended to the entire world, like how whales once did. MGS4 references this as well through Outer Haven, the modified arsenal gear that the Patriots had built before it was stolen by Liquid Ocelot, which if you look at from afar, is shaped like, you guessed it, a whale. It can be truly wonderful the way Kojima can connect so many complex ideas and tie it all together, and Kenji Yano's insight and perspective only serves to further enhance my appreciation for how much effort and thought Kojima puts into his stories. I also have little doubt that Kenji clearly understands Kojima's mindset. I think most, if not all of what he interpreted about Phantom Pain's story is right on the money, but I wish he would show the same level of understanding for the player's perspective. Phantom Pain's story isn't perfect. I love the game, but the story and plot does leave a lot to be desired. I think the game itself is a masterpiece, but the story, not quite there. I appreciate how Kojima tends to deliver relevant messages and themes, and to bring players closer to the series, but there are clear flaws with the narrative and pacing that cannot simply be excused with it's a Moby Dick reference. Depth doesn't always equate to quality. I wish they would stop pandering at the audience and look at the work itself for a change to determine why the audience might have reacted the way they did. And look, I'm well aware that there are many varying opinions on Phantom Pain's story. Some people loved it, others hated it, others are somewhere in between, and some came to appreciate it with time. But some of the criticisms are universal. Even those who loved Phantom Pain won't deny that it's missing certain things, namely Mission 51, and not even they will deny the diminished pacing in Chapter 2. Few will also deny that they would have liked more insight into the real Big Boss's story and the Metal Gear lore as a whole in favor of all the empty spaces. It's a bigger deal to some more than others, but I think it's important to respect those with strong opinions on the matter instead of writing them off for having an alleged lack of understanding. While Kenji has more than succeeded in interpreting Kojima's perspective with some incredible insight, I can't say the same for his interpretation of the player's perspective. I hope one day they can stop self-indulging and actually listen to what people are saying and try to understand their side of things as well. And with that, I would like to end my analysis and discussion of Kenji Yano's interpretation of Phantom Pain's story. Thank you for tuning in. Let us know in the comments below your thoughts about the matter. And to be further updated on all things Kojima and Metal Gear, stay tuned right here on Yong Yeah. I'll see you guys next time. Yong out!